So glad to be here. My name is Terrence Woodbury, and I'm a partner at Hit Strategies, which is a full service research and polling firm, public opinion polling firm. And what that means is uh, we go into communities that are often misunderstood, mis underrepresented in public research and help to uplift their stories through focus groups, um, sitting in rooms with strangers around the country and getting them to disclose things to me that they don't often talk about. Like, why won't they get a vaccine? Or, or polls where it allows us to ask a thousand people a question and make inferences about what a million people might think or what a million people might do. And too, far too often in this, in this line of work, um, there's, there's certain audiences that are underrepresented. We hear people say all the time, you keep talking about polls and ain't nobody ever called to poll me. And so that's what his strategies does is make sure that, that folks like us, folks that are often uh, left, left off of the table or underrepresented are, are actually, that their attitudes and their opinions and their behaviors are actually represented uh, properly in public opinion. So what got you into, um, into politics pretty much? the behind the scenes of the political industry. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I've always been attracted to, to politics. I always knew that I was a, a political animal. Early on, I think that it was like seventh grade, I was assigned a, a, a social studies project in middle school to watch the State of the Union address, you know? And I never missed another one for the rest of my life. And like, I look forward to the president addressing the nation. I thought that that meant I wanted to be the president. <laughs> you know, growing up, I thought that meant, all right, well, I'm going to have to be president. Then Barack Obama became the first Black president. I was quite disappointed because I thought that's what I wanted to do my whole life. But in, but in, in, in working with Barack Obama and, and you know, uh, taking a break from Morehouse and joining his campaign early on, uh, I learned that there were other ways to make a difference in politics, that you didn't have to be the candidate to make mm -hmm. a difference. And in fact, there's a lot of folks behind the scenes that determine, you know, which candidates are, are, are get to get to be pallbearers in our community, which candidates get to represent us and how they represent us. And I really just wanted to be a part of that, being able to recruit and and elevate more diverse candidates, uh, more young candidates, more candidates that look like me in my community. Mm -hmm. So as a political strategist, what is something that you've learned about yourself um, and about our community throughout this journey. You know, black folks are emotional, man. We we take stuff personal. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for a lot of people, at least in in, in my community, in my generation, you know, I, I represent a couple of communities. I'm young. Um, I'm also I'm, I'm a millennial. You know, I'm black. I am male. I'm LGBTQ, and living at the intersection. Of, of, of all of those communities uh, taught me a lot about intersectionality. You know, it taught me that we ain't, we, nobody's just one thing um, and, that, and that we can't be reduced down to a, a single uh, characteristic or a single data point that behind all of that data are people that have shared values and shared experiences um, <clears throat> and, that, and that are quite diverse, you know? In, in, in polling, we look a lot at what's called cross tabs, just like a big Excel sheet. And black folks are typically reduced to one column in that cross tab, if we're lucky. Sometimes it just says POC. And from that one column, you have to deduce what do all people of color think about vaccines? Or what do all people of color think about Joe Biden or about student loans? And we know there's a whole lot of diversity in that column. Not all POCs are the same. Not all black folks are the same. Not all black men are the same, you know? And so that's, that's, uh, that, that, that has been uh, the, the, the most rewarding journey is disaggregating these very diverse communities, understanding where I fit in each of them and just how different they all are in the, in the effort of uplifting all of those stories. So what have you learned about the lack of mo voting amongst black men? Well, you know, this is a this is a tricky question because you know, there's a I I do a lot of work with with black men, with men of color, with young men, um, and understanding their political behavior and patterns and attitudes. And frankly, while black men perform very differently politically than black women. Uh, they vote at different rates. They vote for different people even. 
there's that th that is true about all men that men are less civically engaged not just black men um and so that made me start to explore well what is it about women that makes them uh more not just black women but women feeling more engaged more responsible and you know there's a there, there's a, a a trait that i started tracking in our research called shared responsibility where i asked the question how much of what happens to you impacts other people in your community. And women overwhelmingly have a higher sense of shared responsibility, this community community responsibility. Um, and in doing so that affects how they vote, who they vote for, um, even, even to, the, to the extent where they will vote for, their, for a less preferred candidate because this candidate has a better chance of helping their community, even if I don't like this one as much. This one has a better chance of impacting my community. And there's something around that shared fate. But there's also something about the way that women socialize, you know, uh, that, that talking about politics and posting about politics and going to brunch where there's a lot of politics uh, happening in the, in the conversation in church where there's a lot of politics happening in the pews and in the aisles, that all of that socialization, women are more likely to go to church and more likely to join social organizations and more likely to uh, go to civic meetings. All of that socialization, I think, is a part of what, what, what creates a, a higher civic engagement amongst women. And, that, that, and that, that, that's just not unique to Black men, but, but something that we have to work on uh, with men more broadly. So in your research and, you know, having the opportunity to speak to other people, what do you feel like we as a community or, you know, even politicians, politicians can do to get black men more engaged in the process? Well, the first thing we have to do is meet them where they are. You know, we, we uh, politicians and leaders have a tendency to you know, present information and promote information in the chambers that they are most familiar with. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and frankly, you know, we, we need more politicians that are willing to, and that's a part of why they, they're reaching Black women more in Black churches, or reaching Black women more through Greek letter organizations, or because even the unconventional ways of reaching Black people are still pretty conventional, you know? <laughs> Um, and until we are in the, uh, you know, it's, especially for the for this younger cohort, these black men under the age of 50, if we're not reaching them in the palms of their hands, then we're not reaching them. If your message is not being text or social media or emailed or, or some way de delivered um, uh, in, in that device in their pocket that they're using for four or five hours a day, then we're missing them. You know, and, 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 and you know, this is, there's a, there's a, this common play in politics. You want to go reach black men, let's go do a barbershop tour. Well, yeah, black men are in the barbershop. You know, of course we are. Every black man I know got a barber, you know? <laughs> so you're definitely going to find us there, but there's so many other places. Um, and that's a part of disaggregating that, that single column of black men and understanding their diversity, understanding where they, where they convene and congregate and share information. Now, what about young people? How can politicians attract more young people? And do you feel like voting amongst younger people has increased or decreased over the years? So there's this interesting phenomenon that happens, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a data guy. So I said a lot in the data and in these cross tabs and graphs, and there's interesting phenomenon that happens as people get older, it's a direct correlation the older that they get, the more likely they are to vote. Those two lines literally grow at the exact same level. Every year that you get older, your likelihood to vote gets a little bit higher. And, you know, I, I think anecdotally, we know that grownups got real life stuff to deal with, you know, and taxes and, uh, and healthcare and childcare and tuitions and things that start to make us pay attention um, to who's making these decisions on our behalf. But frankly, the decisions that are being made in the chambers of power are affecting young people more than anyone else. We will have to live with these decisions longer than anyone else. In fact, I think young votes should count twice, you know, <laughs> like, because I have to live with this twice as long as you do, you know. 
Uh, and so I, I think that it is, it, is, it is imperative on us to make young people who have become, you know, millennials and Gen Z, anyone that's under the age of 40, have become the biggest voting bloc in America, bigger than every other generation combined. We just don't vote at the same rate because we don't think it impacts us at the same rate. And so it's imperative on, on us, um, people like me that work in politics and people like you that have platforms um, that reach a lot of young people, that we start to uh, demonstrate the way that, in, that politics impacts them and the way that they can begin to impact politics. So what sort of conversations surrounding politics should be had um, in order to in, not only engage with the people, but get them actually to the polls? You know, one thing that I've encouraged a lot of a lot of the, the candidates and the organizations that we work with is that um, there's a there's often this debate between like kitchen table politics, which are considered, you know, the economics, the, 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 the purse string politics, wages and and, and the cost of healthcare and the cost of childcare and the cost of education, which are extremely important issues, but they're often uh, kind of put in opposition to identity politics, immigration and women's choice and um, you know racism and these more social issues that are less pocketbook and more social. And one thing I've been trying to convince a lot of the candidates and organizations that we work with is that for young people and for people of color, our identities are not separate from our politics. You, they're inextricable. You can't talk about the cost of education to me without talking about the disparity in that cost to people of color. You know, you can't talk about healthcare to me without talking about the disparity of healthcare outcomes amongst people of color. So there's no such thing as kitchen table issues separate from identity. Our identities are our, are our politics. And until politicians and political organizations begin to engage people that way and in an authentic, because we see it, we see the disparity. You know, we don't have to vote every day, watch CNN every day, read the New York Times every day to see that this shit ain't fair. You know, the, 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 the cards are not stacked evenly. And so we have to begin having those honest conversations because it's like a young black man said to me in a focus group in Florida just, uh, just before the 2020 election, when I was trying to ask him, well, why don't you vote if these things matter to you so much? You got Joe Biden on one side and Donald Trump on the other. Why don't you, why, does, why are you still deciding to not vote a month before election day? And he said, look, my hood ain't getting no better under Barack Obama. And it ain't gotten no worse under Donald Trump. So what any of these presidents got to do with me? Until we start connecting the dots of how what's happening in that Oval Office and that ivory tower in Washington affects their lives every day, then we can't expect them to engage any more than they have. And you know, saying that, a lot of people don't really understand that elections happen more than just every four years. There are state elections, there are local elections. And how do you feel that we can mobilize, honestly, not only the youth, but those people who feel like those um, general local state elections don't matter or don't affect them? How can we get people more involved in those elections? Well, first we can start putting some people on the ballot that look like them and that represent them, that come from their communities, you know? Uh, it's, it, it is hard to mobilize, uh, you know, a young, diverse LGBTQ mother, you know, to vote for a, 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 a ticket of candidates where every single one of them is at least 30 years older than her. Every single one of them is white. Every single one of them has a very different lived experience that probably includes an Ivy League institution somewhere. That, that, that it's hard to mobilize people around that. And so we gotta change what the candidates look like, but we also have to change the way that we communicate. There's a, a level of investment that is made in federal elections to tell people who Joe Biden is, who Raphael Warnock is, who all these federal candidates are, what they stand for, what they do. And we're not making that same investment. And so in focus groups, they say stuff to me like, 
it seems like they only want us to know what's happening when it's time to vote for them. Because them text messages stop coming to my phone after they get elected. And I used to call that cynicism. But in fact, it's realism. That's exactly what's happening. They spent $20 million to get people like you to vote, but they're not going to make the same investment to get people like you to pay attention to the legislation that's coming on the ballot or to the the school board member that determines your child's you know, cost of uh, 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 education. And so there is some civic engagement that we have to do, and it's gonna cost some money because it's not happening far too often. It's not happening in our classrooms. And so we have to offer civic engagement to adults now that, 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 didn't, that didn't receive what, that when they were supposed to. Now, what are your thoughts on voter suppression in states like Georgia and Texas? You know, uh, the truth is that there has been some effort to limit or reduce access to voting since 2020 in all 50 states. And in all 50 states, there has been some effort to limit access to the ballot or limit the times or the people that can vote. And the way I've been describing it is, look, politicians are trying to start picking their voters instead of voters picking, their, picking our politicians. They're really trying to reverse the tables here. And it's a dangerous, dangerous game that they're doing, that they're playing. <clears throat> but until we start creating some urgency around this, you know, a lot of people, a lot of folks that I talked to about voter suppression, I mean, as recently as last week in, in focus groups, I hear, I hear black people tell me voter suppression is not an issue anymore. That's a relic of the civil rights movement that they keep waving in our faces to keep us distracted from the things that really matter. You know, this idea that we saw that as in, in, uh, in, in civil rights without the civic engagement of knowing that, well, the Voting Rights Act has been all but gutted and reversed you know, and states across the country are trying to make it harder for you, people like you to vote, not just for any, make it harder for anybody to vote, but people that look like me and that look like you and that look like a lot of the, 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 the audience um, that we have here. And so uh, we have, this is the civic engagement that we have to do. We have to raise the urgency here. And I'll give, you know, I think George is a good example of that. Stacey Abrams has raised the urgency of voting rights in Georgia to the point where if I ask black people anywhere in the country, what is the top issue in your community? And I give them 10 issues, voting rights is normally number eight, nine, or 10. But if I ask the same question to black people in Georgia, it's number one, two, or three. And it's because the work that Stacey Abrams has been doing to wave the red flag and say, hey, we got a problem over here. Y'all better keep your eyes on Brian Kemp. And now they're keeping their eyes on Brian Kemp. And so we got to do the same thing nationally. Now, as you look at the trends in voting and the trends in um, participation in politics, what do you see coming over, you know, the next four years, the next 10 years? You know, as young people begin to, millennials, Gen Z, everyone that was, every, everyone that's under 40 years old, as young people really begin to assume our power in the body politic. I ask people, I ask young people in focus groups all the time, how much different would your community look if only people your age and younger were allowed to vote? Would you still have issues with student loans? Would you still have issues with climate change? Would you still have issues with immigrant? Probably not, because we are, we are generally aligned on most of those social issues. As a generation, you know, um, as a generation, young people are moving, are, are, are prepared to move past racism, right? I, I, I was looking at the protest of 2020. At, right after George Floyd's death, we all saw people take to the streets across the nation in almost every, in, in almost all 50 states, we saw protests. But the one thing that, 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 was, that stood out to me so much was the complexion of that protest, that the majority of protesters were white. And I started describing it as, uh, that 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 58% of protesters were white, but 80% of protesters were under the age of 50. And I began to describe it as a movement, as, a, as an evolution from of black people versus the police, which it has been for the for generations, to a movement of young people versus racism. 
And as young people begin to take our rightful place in the body politic, I think that we're going to start to see a lot of things change. But it, but it, 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 it has to be more than us just coming of age. We have to take our place at the voting booth. We have to take their place in Congress, literally oppose them and beat them and replace them. We, that, I mean, taking our rightful place is going to be a power grab, not a power handoff. Now, <clears throat> for those people who feel like politics don't affect them, for those people who feel as if the people who are in office don't hear them, for the people who feel like my vote, my voice does not matter, what, um, what advice would you give them? What would you say to these individuals to show them the complete opposite, that their voice, their vote, um, it, it does matter? Well, first I would, I would push back and say, it, it's not that, that politics doesn't work or that voting doesn't work as much as it is that politics only works for those that are working in it. You know, when you look at the most likely voters in America, I'll give you, prime example, the most likely voter in America is over the age of 80. Seniors are going to vote every time they vote. You know what you're never going to see on the chopping block in a, in a, in a congressional debate? Medicare. <laughs> you know? Because seniors vote. Get your hands off my Medicare. If, if, if millennials were voting at the same rate as seniors, student loans would have already been forgiven because it's a top priority for us, the same way Medicare is a top priority for them. And so there is a way to move the issues that matter to us. But we're, again, we're gonna to have to power grab here, folks. We cannot wait for them to hand power to us. It doesn't, power does not concede easily without force. But I, I am 100% I, I am positive that young people, the majority minority generation, you know, the internet generation, Hell, the recession generation, you know, the generation that we didn't been through a couple recessions already. We are the force. Uh, we just have to, we just have to take our rightful place here. Okay. Terrence, I absolutely thank you for this conversation. Now for the people who are um, tuning into this interview, once we post it, um, how can people stay connected with you? How can people see some of the work that you're doing or even be involved with some of the work that you're doing? Absolutely. So Hitch Strategies produces quite a bit of intelligence, focus groups and polling and data about this, the, the, the state of our communities, um, about the, the attitudes and the priorities of our communities. I mean, things that are often um, overlooked and misunderstood. We just did a poll of black trans people, you know, I mean, th there's, th there, are, there are communities here that we are all either representative of or adjacent to that, 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 that need to have our stories uplifted. And so we do that quite a bit on our website at www.hitstrat.com. Also on Twitter at hitstrat.com, hitstrat, just like hit strategies. Um, and then, of course, you can follow me where, I'm, where I promote a lot of the, the work that we're doing at T underscore Woodbury, W-O-O-D-B-U-R-Y, T underscore Woodbury on Twitter.